The Hyperengine was a 1930s study project by the United States Army Air Corps USAAC, to develop a high-performance aircraft engine that would be equal to or better than the aircraft and engines then under development in Europe. The project goal was to produce an engine that was capable of delivering one horsepower, in three 46 kilowatts per liter of engine displacement for a weight of less than one pound per horsepower delivered. The ultimate design goal was an increased power-to-weight ratio suitable for long-range airliners and bombers. At the time, no production engine could come close to the requirements, although this milestone had been met by special modified or purpose-built racing engines such as the Napier Lion and Rolls-Royce R a typical large engine of the era, the Pratt & Whitney R1830 Twin Wasp Radial, developed about 1,200 horsepower 895 kilowatts from 1,830 in 3-30L, so an advance of at least 50% would be needed. Simply scaling up an existing design would not solve the problem. While it would have increased the total available power, it would not have any significant effect on the power to weight ratio. For that, more radical changes were needed. Several engines were built as part of the Hyper program, but for a variety of reasons, none of these saw production use. Air cooled engines from a variety of U.S. companies were delivering similar power ratings by the early 1940s, and the licensed production of the Rolls Royce Merlin as the Packard V1650 provided hyper like performance from an inline, while the Allison V1710 did the same from a U.S. design, one produced as a private effort outside the hyper program. Topic design and development improvements in construction and lighter materials had already delivered some benefits on the way to higher power to weight ratios. Aluminum was being introduced in place of steel as the quality and strength of aluminum alloys improved during the 1930s. This lowered engine weight noticeably, but not enough to achieve a 50% overall improvement. To reach that goal, the power of the engine would also need to be increased. Power is a combination of energy and the rate it is delivered, so to improve the power to weight ratio, one would need to increase the operating pressures of the engine, the operating speed, or a combination of both. Further gains could be made by eliminating losses like friction, combustion inefficiencies, and scavenging losses, delivering more of the theoretical power to the propeller. The USAAC engineers determined that it would study all three improvements. Before long, they concluded that increasing the combustion temperature and scavenging efficiency promised the greatest increases of all of the possibilities. To meet that goal, increasing engine speed seemed to be the most attractive solution. However, there were a number of practical problems that were impeding progress in these areas. Increasing the compression ratio is an easy change that improves the mean effective pressure MEP, but leads to engine knocking from inconsistent detonation. Uncontrolled, knock can damage the engine and was a major block on the way to improved power settings. This change would also increase the operating temperatures, which presented a problem with the valves. Valves were already reaching temperatures that would cause pre-ignition of the fuel as it flowed past them. Increasing operational speed is also, theoretically, a simple change to the engine design. However, at high operating speeds the valves do not completely close before the cam opens them again, a problem called valve float. Valve float allows gases in the cylinder to escape through the partially open valve, reducing the engine efficiency. Increasing valve spring pressure to close the valves faster led to rapid cam wear and increased friction, reducing overall performance by more than any horsepower gained. As valves were a key issue in both approaches to improved performance, they had been a major area of research in the 1920s and 30s. In the UK, Harry Ricardo had written an influential paper on the sleeve valve system for exactly these reasons, claiming it was the only way forward. He had some success in selling this idea, most notably to Bristol Aeroplane Company Engines, where Roy Fedden became a believer. Ricardo's friendly competitor, Frank Halford, designed his own sleeve valve engine with Napier and Son, another prominent British engine maker. The USAAC was not so convinced that the sleeve valve was the only solution. 
Ironically it was one of Ricardo's papers on the sleeve valve design that led to the USAAC's hyper-engine efforts. In one late 1920s paper he claimed that the one horsepower, in cubed goal was impossible to achieve with poppet valve type engines. The USAAC engineering team at Wright Field decided to test this claim by beating it. They proposed an engine of about 1,200 cubic inches 20L, hoping the engine's smaller size would lead to reduced drag and hence improved range. Hyper No. 1 Sam Heron, head of development at Wright Field and a former colleague of Ricardo while Heron had been working at the Royal Aircraft Factory, Farnborough, started working on the problem with a single-cylinder test engine that he converted to liquid cooling, using a Liberty L12 engine cylinder. He pushed the power to 480 psi brake mean effective pressure, and the coolant temperature to 300 degrees Fahrenheit 149 degrees Celsius before reaching the magic numbers. By 1932, the USAAC's encouraging efforts led the Army to sign a development contract with Continental Motors Company for the continued development of the engine design. The contract limited Continental's role to construction and testing, leaving the actual engineering development to the Army. Starting with the L-12 cylinder, they decreased the stroke from 7 in to 5 in in order to allow higher engine speeds, and then decreased the bore from 5 in to 4.62 in, creating the 84 in cubed cylinder. This would be used in a V-12 engine of 1008 in cubed displacement. They used the L-12's overhead camshaft to operate multiple valves of smaller size, which would improve charging and scavenging efficiency. Continental's first test engine, the single-cylinder Hyper No. 1, first ran in 1933. They eventually determined that exhaust valves could run cooler when a hollow core filled with sodium is used. The sodium liquefies and considerably increases the heat transfer from the valve's head to its stem and then to the relatively cooler cylinder head where the liquid coolant picks it up. Liquid cooling systems at that time used plain water, which limited operating temperatures to about 180 degrees Fahrenheit 82 degrees Celsius. The engineers proposed using ethylene glycol, which would allow temperatures up to 280 degrees Fahrenheit. At first they proposed using 100% glycol, but there was little improvement due to the lower specific heat of the glycol about two-thirds that of water. They eventually determined that a 50-50 mixture by volume of water and glycol provided optimal heat removal. <laughs> Topic. Hyper number two. A second cylinder was added to Hyper No. 1 to make a horizontal opposed engine for evaluation of an opposed piston 12-cylinder engine. After running the modified engine with different combinations of cylinder bore and stroke, it was found that the high coolant temperature required to maintain the required output was impractical. A third high-performance single-cylinder engine was then constructed with lower operating parameters. This engine was designated Hyper No. 2, and became the testbed for developing the cylinders that would become the 014301. Topic: <laughs> Continental O, V, I, V, X, I, V, 1430. The Army apparently became concerned about the development of a suitable supercharger for high altitude use, and for further development in 1934 they asked for a newer cylinder with slightly less performance and an increased volume of 118.8 in 3 from its 5.5 in 140 mm bore and 5.0 in 130 mm stroke. This size cylinder would then be used in a 1425 in 312 cylinder engine, delivering the same 1000 horsepower, with a performance of 0.7 horsepower, in 3. This placed its performance on a par with newer experimental engines from Europe like the Rolls-Royce PV-12, at least when running on the higher octane fuels the Army planned to use. Another change was to the engine layout. 
The Army, convinced that future aircraft designs would use engines buried in the wings for additional streamlining, asked Continental to design a full-sized flat-opposed piston engine for installation inside a wing. The resulting engine was the Continental O1430, which would require a 10-year development period which changed the layout to first an upright V12 engine and later, an inverted V12 engine before becoming reliable enough to be considered for full production as the Continental IV1430 in 1943. By then other engines had already passed its 1,600 horsepower 1,200 kilowatts rating, and although the IV-1430 had a better power-to-weight ratio, there was little else to suggest setting up production in the middle of the war was worthwhile. The project was eventually guided by the requirements in the Request for Data R40C which was included as a part of the financial year FY 1940 aircraft procurement program. Topic. Request for Data R40C As 1938 came to an end, the war in Europe heated to its boiling point. At this point, European aircraft had greatly surpassed U.S. designs. The two top USAAC fighters, the Seversky P-35 and the Curtis P-36A, were just able to hit 300 miles per hour (480 kilometers per hour). Against the 340 plus mph Messerschmitt Bf 109, they would be completely outclassed. The twin-engined Lockheed XP-38 was entering an extended test program. Although the XP-38 was able to fly at speeds in excess of 413 miles per hour, it was big and heavy, and was therefore not as maneuverable as its stablemates. The XP-38 also had a newly introduced liquid-cooled engine, the Allison V1710. The Allison's inline V-cylinder arrangement allowed for a narrow aerodynamic shape that had less drag than the air-cooled radial engine fighters that predominated in America at the time. The fighter aircraft procurement program for FY 1940 was contained in a document that was approved by Assistant Secretary of War Louis K. Johnson on the 9th of June 1939. That document was the Request for Data R40C. And unlike previous aircraft procurement requests, it was sent to only a limited number of aircraft manufacturers. The original document was to be sent to Bell Aircraft Corporation Consolidated Aircraft Corporation Curtis Wright Corporation Curtis Airplane Division Curtis Wright Corporation, St. Louis Airplane Division Grumman Aircraft Engineering Corporation Lockheed Aircraft Corporation Republic Aviation Corporation Vought Sikorsky Aircraft Division, United Aircraft Corporation Vultee Aircraft Division, Aviation Manufacturing Corporation After final review and approval as Air Corps Type Specification XC-622, a further four manufacturers were added to the distribution Hughes Aircraft Corporation McDonnell Aircraft Company Boeing Aircraft Company Northrop Aircraft, Inc. These companies had only 10 days to agree to the terms of the document, and only 30 days to submit their designs. Topic FY 1940 A total of 26 designs, with a mix of 16 engine models from six engine companies, were submitted by seven of the selected companies. These engines became known as the Hyper Engines, a contraction of high performance engines. The submitted designs were graded using a Figure of Merit FOM rating system, and then, using the FOM results, which ranged from 444.12 for the Allison V1710E8 to 817.90 for the Pratt & Whitney X1800A4G, they were separated into one of three groups. Those placed in the first group were little more than modifications to existing designs. They were not considered to be sufficiently advanced. Those placed in the third group proposed using an engine that was unlikely to be developed into flying condition by the time the airframe was ready to fly. They were not considered to be viable in the time frame allowed. 
The remaining ten designs were placed in the second group, those that were an advancement in aeronautical engineering, with an engine that would be ready to fly, when needed. Only three of these ten designs were approved, and contracts were made for a limited prototype run of three aircraft for each. The three aircraft engine combinations that were selected Vulti Aircraft's Model 70 Alternate 2, FOM Score, 817.9, which became the Vulti XP 54, powered by the Pratt. And Whitney X1800A 4G engine Curtis Wright Street Louis Model P248C, FOM score, 770.6, which became the Curtis Wright XP55 Ascender, powered by the Continental IV14303 engine Northrop's Model N2B, FOM score, 725. 8, which became the Northrop XP-56 Black Bullet, powered by the Pratt & Whitney X1800A 3G engine. Topic FY 1941 Three additional high-performance engines were considered for the USAAC's FY 1942 engine procurement program. They were, Wright R2160 Tornado Pratt & Whitney H3130 Allison V3420 not to be left out, the U.S. Navy selected the Lycoming XH2470 for funding in FY 1942 as well. Topic program end In the end, all of these programs were cancelled, and the surviving engines became museum pieces. Ironically, engines that were not considered under the program, the Allison V1710, Pratt & Whitney R2800 Double Wasp, Wright R3350 Duplex Cyclone and Pratt & Whitney R4360 Wasp Major, all surpassed the USAAC requirements, and continue flying into the 21st century, primarily flying restored warbird aircraft. Topic. See also Bomber B, the German Luftwaffe's advanced medium bomber program that used similar high-output aviation powerplants of over 1,500 kW output apiece. <laughs>